I want you to open your Bibles, please, to the Gospel of John, chapter 14. It's a very familiar part of the Bible. John, chapter 14. And as you're turning, let me say, if you're watching us by YouTube or the Internet, we appreciate it. And we hope that these sermons and our lessons, and I know I can speak on behalf of Pastor Gene, ha, uh, Pastor Kim, uh, we hope these things are a blessing to you and trust that they are. But uh, don't just watch. If you're at home, you're sitting at a desk, you're sitting at a table, looking at your laptop or your, you've got us on the big screen in your living room, get your Bible with you. Turn to the scriptures as we turn to them because the lessons will be much more effective and they'll produce more understanding in you. If you study with us, there are some folks that don't have a good church to go to where they where the Bible is believed and the Bible is preached nearby. And so we fill a, a, a void that a lot of people have, unfortunately, and we're happy that we can. But turn in the scriptures with us as we turn. I think the preaching and the lessons will be much more instructive and beneficial if you do. All right. John chapter 14. Let me read verses 1, 2, and 3. Let not your heart be troubled. Ye believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. Today I call this sermon, The Three Houses of Jesus. The Three Houses of Jesus. First, the Bible tells us that when Peter and Andrew met the Lord Jesus, they asked him, John chapter 1, verse 38, Rabbi, where dwellest thou? And he said to them, Come and see. They came and saw where he dwelt and abode with him that day. But the Bible doesn't tell us that they entered into a house with Jesus. And the impression you get when you read that story is that Christ must have been camped outdoors somewhere when they found him. We read, A certain scribe came and said unto him, Master, I will follow thee whithersoever thou goest. Jesus saith unto him, The foxes have holes, and the birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man hath not where to lay his head, there in Matthew 8, verse 20. We read about Jesus entering Peter's house to heal his sick mother-in-law, Matthew 8, verse 14. He went into the house of Jairus, the ruler of the synagogue, to heal his sick daughter, in Mark chapter 5, verse 39. And he was received into the house of Mary, Martha, and Lazarus, numerous times during his ministry. But the Bible never says that Jesus lived in his own house while he was on the earth. As best as we can tell, the Lord Jesus was homeless during his public ministry. He said he came to do the will of the Father who had sent him, John 6, verse 38, uh, but that will apparently didn't involve setting up a household while he was here on the earth. And yet there are three houses of the Lord Jesus Christ I want to call to your attention today. First, there was the house in heaven. The house in heaven. He mentions it here in our text, verse 2. In my father's house are many mansions. In ages past, long before he ever came into the world, long before he was born of a virgin, Jesus Christ dwelt in the home of the Heavenly Father in eternal glory. Before the universe began, the Son of God was in heaven with God the Father. The house in heaven. And he alludes to it in John 17, verse 5. When he prayed, O Father, glorify thou me with thine own self, with the glory which I had with thee before the world was. Psalm 
16, verse 11, declares, Thou wilt show me the path of life. In thy presence is fullness of joy. At thy right hand there are pleasures forevermore. We're charged in the New Testament, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him, endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. Hebrews 12, verse 2. At the right hand of God the Father was joy and pleasure and glory beyond description. And it was at God's right hand that God the Son wanted to return. And this he did when he ascended back to heaven, according to Acts 1, verse 9, according to Ephesians 1, verse 20. But let me say, he didn't go back just for himself, right? He says in our text, in my father's house are many mansions. Then he says, I go to prepare a place for you. So he didn't go back just for himself. The Bible tells us, all thy garments smell of myrrh and aloes and cassia out of the ivory palaces, plural, whereby they have made thee glad. Psalm 45, verse 8. The Bible says, beautiful for situation, the joy of the whole earth is Mount Zion on the sides of the north, the city of the great king. God is known in her palaces, plural, for refuge. Psalm 48, verses 2 and 3. Not just in my father's house there are many rooms or many dwelling places like all the modern Bibles uh, reduce it down to, but mansions. Listen, if God's uh, footstool is earth and heaven is his throne and the whole universe is his dwelling place, there's plenty of room for each of, each of us to have a mansion, right? The Father's house, the house in heaven, will be the eternal home of the saints one day. It's described as a city, the city of the great king. As a city, it's given a name, the holy city, New Jerusalem, Revelation 21, verse 2. The Lord Jesus told the apostle John, him that overcometh will I make a pillar in the temple of my God, and he shall go no more out, and I will write upon him the name of my God, and the name of the city of my God, which is New Jerusalem, Revelation 3, verse 12. Paul also wrote, but Jerusalem, which is above, is free, which is the mother of us all, Galatians 4, verse 26. Jesus Christ left his father's heavenly house and was born into the world. But after he was raised from the dead, after he received a new glorified body, incorruptible body, he returned and is now seated once again at the right hand of God the Father. According to Romans chapter 8, verse 34, it's at the Father's right hand uh, where Jesus Christ intercedes for us when we call upon God. To him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcame and am set down with my Father in his throne. Revelation 3 Verse 21, he says in our text today, that where I am, there ye may be also. Don't you want to be where Jesus Christ is? Don't you get tired of living in a world without Jesus Christ? Don't you get tired of living in a world that doesn't want Jesus Christ? Where I am, there ye may be also. But the first house of Jesus is the one we should all have on our minds because that's where we're heading one day. The house in heaven, New Jerusalem, that is your future home as a believer in Jesus Christ. We always sing, this world is not my home. I'm just a passing through. My treasures are laid up somewhere beyond the blue. Secondly, there was the house in history. Turn, if you will, to Luke chapter 2. 
Luke chapter 2. The baby Jesus was born in a stable in Bethlehem. You've ever heard the question, were you born in a barn? Christ was born effectively in a barn. But he didn't remain there. The shepherds nearby in the same country, the Bible says, they came to the place and saw the babe, the Bible says, wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. But the wise men did not. It doesn't matter what people display on their front lawns at Christmas time. They've got it all screwed up anyway. But the wise men knew that Bethlehem would be the place where the Messiah was born. But the timetable hadn't been made clear to them. After they came to Jerusalem and sought out Herod the king, they told him who they were, where they had come from, why they were there. The Bible says they departed, and lo, the star which they saw in the east went before them, till it came and stood over where the young child was, not the babe. Matthew 2, verse 9. We read, and when they were come into the house, not the stable, they saw the young child, not the baby, and with Mary his mother, and fell down and worshipped him. Matthew 2, verse 11. Herod ordered the killing of all the children in around the coast of Bethlehem, two years old and under, trying to uh, eliminate any future threat or any future challenge to his throne based solely on the information the wise men had given him. But Christ was no longer a baby in a manger when the wise men arrived, uh, nor was he in the town of Bethlehem any longer. They probably weren't there any longer than that first night, if the truth be told. Notice Luke chapter 2, verses 39 and 40. Jesus Christ was about a month and a half old when they dedicated him in the temple. They're also in Luke chapter 2. Verses 39 and 40 say, And when they had performed all things according to the law of the Lord, they turned into Galilee to their own city, Nazareth, and the child grew and waxed strong in spirit, filled with wisdom, and the grace of God was upon him. The wise men were obviously led to the house in Nazareth. Uh, well after his dedication, and Christ was a toddler, getting close to two years old, if you study the narrative very carefully. Verse 42 says, And when he was 12 years old, they went up to Jerusalem after the custom of the feast. And most of you should know the story about Christ being lost, and they found him later. At least you should. The, at the, on that trip, they went to Jerusalem, the custom of the feast, probably the time of the Passover, and Jews from all over the known world would travel to Jerusalem if they could to participate in that uh, annual feast. So the Virgin Mother of God, Blessed Mary, Queen of Heaven, right, our light, our sweetness, our salvation, so forth, all that gobbledygook, she lost the Lord Jesus Christ on that trip. You go over to L.A. County Fair, like they have right now, there's 50,000 people roaming around the grounds there. If you don't hold on to your kid's hand, you're a fool. That wasn't very good parenting, if you ask me. Verse 46, And it came to pass that after three days they found him in the temple, sitting in the midst of the doctors, both hearing them and asking them questions. And all that heard him were astonished at his understanding and answers. Verse 51. And he went down with them, that's Joseph and Mary, and came to Nazareth and was subject unto them, but his mother kept all these sayings in her heart. To think of the downward descent of the Lord Jesus Christ, to leave the home in heaven, the right hand of God the Father, to be born as a baby, 
to humble parents and then become subject unto them as long as he was a young man in the house in history is a real study in humility. The Lord asked Pharaoh back in Exodus 10 verse 3, How long wilt thou refuse to humble thyself before me? Christ taught, Matthew 18, verse 4, Whosoever therefore shall humble himself as this little child, the same is greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And James chapter 4, verse 6 tells us, God resisteth the proud, but giveth grace unto the humble. The reason there are so many reminders to humility in the word of God is because Normally, the normal reaction is for people to think of themselves more highly than they should. People can get stuck on themselves for doing what they were expected to do anyway. I, I've worked with people who uh, want the boss to know that they just did the chore he had told them to do. As if they're going to earn extra brownie points, you know, extra a raise next time you you know, you do exactly what I tell you. I'm going to give you a raise. You don't get any raise for doing what you're told to do. A few years ago, there was a guy in the White House. He had the audacity to write two autobiographies, and he hadn't done anything yet. But the greatest hu example of humility, true humility, was the life of the Lord Jesus Christ. Philippians 2, verse 7, says he, quote, made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men and being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself. Paul would later write, and without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh. 1 Timothy 2, verse 16. As a baby, Jesus cried. I know the Christmas carol says no crying he makes, but don't believe that. As a baby, Jesus cried. As a baby, Jesus poo-pooed his diaper. As a baby, he had to be nursed. As a baby, he had to be rocked to sleep. As a baby, he had to be washed and cleaned. As a young man, Jesus had to eat. He had to drink. He had to sleep. He had to go to the bathroom. He had to do all the things that everyone does in life. As long as he was in the house in history, he was subject to his parents here on the earth. The scriptures don't tell us a lot about the home life of the Lord Jesus when he was young. Matthew chapters 12 and 13 tell us that Jesus had other brothers and sisters, other children of Joseph and Mary. Never mind what the Catholic Church teaches about the perpetual virginity of Mary. By the way, ask your Catholic friend or relative this question. You, you really believe in the perpetual virginity of Mary, don't you? If you find someone who says yes, you can say, well, doesn't that mean you also have to teach the perpetual virginity of Joseph? As he had liberties like the Kennedy brothers had. So they, never they never carry it that far. They never go that far with the point. But according to Matthew 13, verses 55 and 56, Jesus had four younger brothers and at least two sisters, himself being the oldest of at least seven kids. If you've never... been around a family that had seven children. A lot of wild times go on. <laughs> Getting ready to go to synagogue on the Sabbath day. There's only one outhouse for all of you to use. We had three kids in my family and Sunday morning we had one bathroom in our house. We were all standing next to each other trying to squeeze for, for you know, mirror time to comb our hair and so forth. Um, but um, very chaotic. Those younger brothers and sisters must have known about Jesus 
having gotten lost on that trip, maybe they had gone along with him. They must have heard the rumors concerning their oldest brother having been born illegitimate. In John chapter 8, those stories were still circulating, being talked about in Christ's ministry. The Pharisees said to him, we be not born of fornication. And the implication was that he was. They must have had a hard time believing the things that their parents had told them about their oldest brother being the promised Messiah, the one who would save the nation one day. The Bible says they were offended in him. Jesus said, a prophet is not without honor, save in his own country and among his own house. Matthew 13, verse 57. His own family members, his brothers and sisters, they couldn't believe the incredible idea that he would be the savior of Israel one day. They knew him. They had grown up with him. I would imagine in that culture, like a lot of cultures, all the children, maybe the parents on, on either end, slept in one big bed. Kids didn't have their own bedrooms in those days. They all slept in one big bed, and uh, you're just hoping the youngest one doesn't wet, you know, that night. That's the way it goes. They, ate, they sat at the same table and ate with them. They fed the barnyard animals together. And to think that the second person of the Godhead would have left his home in heaven and be subject to earthly parents, all those earthly siblings with him, uh, who would later reject him, It was the humility of his house in history. To go from being the eternal deity of the universe, to come into time and space, enter into your own creation in the form of a man, to live among men, to walk among men, and be able to identify with men is a real lesson in humility. That's also why God the Father is justified and he's cleared of any wrongdoing when someone wants to accuse him and say, well, what does God know about life? He's never gone through anything, but through the Lord Jesus Christ, he can say, I know what it is to be hungry. I know what it is to be talked about. I know what it is to be gossiped behind my back. I know what it is to be accused right to my face. I know what it is to be forsaken by my uh, closest friends and rejected by my own uh, family and blood. I know what it is to be stripped naked and hanged on a cross of shame and um, disgrace. I know what it is to be wrongfully put to death. So he can identify with the worst scenarios the sinner faces. He can say, I know what it is to have gone through my life homeless. A lot of people suffering that plight these days. Even the Apostle Paul says, and having food and raiment, let us therewith be content. He doesn't even include a roof over your head. If you have a roof over your head, that's icing on the cake. Thank God for that in the modern world we live in. Thank God for the blankets you had over you and the pillow you laid your head on last night. But even that's not guaranteed. Thirdly, lastly, I want you to turn in your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 3. Ephesians chapter 3. And we'll begin there at verse 14. Down through verse 19. Ephesians 3. And start there at verse 14. Paul writes, For this cause I bow my knees unto the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, of whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named. Christ had houses in both of those places. That he would grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with might by his Spirit in the inner man, that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith, that ye, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all saints what is the breadth 
and length and depth and height, and to know the love of Christ, which passeth knowledge, that ye might be filled with all the fullness of God. According to verse 17, there is the house in the heart, that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith. Notice the Apostle Paul, he's not appealing to unsaved people to turn to Jesus Christ. He's writing to Christians. They're already saved. Jesus Christ could, that he's praying that Jesus Christ could dwell within their hearts with all the hope, with all the confidence, with all the assurance, the, the assurance, with all the joy that every Christian ought to have. With all the confidence that he indeed lives inside of you and never leave you or forsake you. Jesus Christ would be at home inside their hearts. I don't know about you, but I want the house of my heart to feel like home to the Lord Jesus Christ. If you're born again, if there's been a time in your life when you truly were saved by the power of Jesus Christ and the grace of God, and there's no denying that, there's no doubting that, you might never do, you might er, never do anything for the glory of Jesus Christ. But I'll tell you what, you're still heading towards New Jerusalem. You're still going to receive a glorified body like that of the Lord Jesus Christ. And in light of that, I don't want to get to eternity one day and have my reputation be one of embarrassment. I don't want to bring shame or embarrassment to the Lord Jesus Christ. Someone who loved me enough to die for me first. And then for me to not be willing to live for him. And I don't think any of you would desire that legacy either. But... Uh, Paul writes, excuse me, excuse me. <clears throat> Paul writes that the believer should be strengthened with might by his spirit in the inner man, verse 16 here, to be rooted and grounded in love, verse 17, and to be filled with all the fullness of God, verse 19. <laughs> I'm going to begin to bring this to a close today. Right now, each of you live in a house in history of some kind. If you've been born again, you're heading for a house in heaven, New Jerusalem. That'll be your dwelling place forever. But until then, let me ask, what condition is the house in your heart like? One thing I can say about our congregation here, Bible Baptist Church, you never have to uh, pull and milk an invitation. We can say, let's have an invitation, let's have an altar call. If there's something you want to talk to God about, you need to talk to God about. You know, don't sit there, hold on to that pew and resist. We're going to bring this to a close, but we're going to have an invitation this morning. And uh, sometimes you can, you can uh, affect great change. You can, you can do some great things between you and God. Get out of your seat publicly and go forward. Let all of your brethren see that this Christian, that young man, that young lady, they mean business with God today. It'll be a shot in their arm. It'll be an encouragement to them. And it'll do great things for you as well.